Good morning, everyone. Stop, Hachim. Stop. And welcome to today's national webinar, which is organized by Department of Chemistry in collaboration with IQC of Bosirhat College. Today we have two very renowned and promising young speakers with us: Professor Shyam Bhattacharya from Aizar, Kolkata, and Dr. Shomnad Yadav from IIT ISM Dhanbad. We are very thankful to both of them for accepting our invitation. We are thankful to our honourable principal, Dr. Ashok Kumar Mondol, for encouraging and motivating us to organise today's seminar. We are also thankful to our IQC coordinator, Professor Ashok Kumar Roy, for his support and collaboration. Now, before starting this session, I would request our honourable principal. Dr. Ashok Kumar Mondol to deliver the key address to today's webinar. Sir. Thank you, Monajit Sarkar. Very good morning, everybody participated in this webinar today. I have immense pleasure to welcome our honorable speakers in today's webinar of Boshirat College, organized by the Department of Chemistry in collaboration with IQHE of our colleagues. We have two honorable speakers today. The first speaker in the first session is Professor Dr. Simon Bhattacharya, ISR, Kolkata. And in the second session, we have another eminent speaker, Dr. Somnath Jado, IIT Dhanbad. We are really very grateful to those eminent speakers for giving us their valuable time for our webinar today. I must welcome all the faculty members of other departments of our college and also the other faculty members participated in this webinar from other institutions. And I also welcome the students of the Department of Chemistry present in this webinar today. I would like to convey my hearty thanks to all the faculty members of the Department of Chemistry for their wholehearted effort for organizing such a nice webinar with such an important and relevant topic within these pandemic situations. I am also thankful to all the members of IQC cell and its coordinator, Professor Ashok Rai, for his sincere and active support in organizing this webinar. Finally, I would like to thank to Professor Chinmoy Ghosh and his support members for their first technical assistance in conducting this webinar. I hope that all the participants, including our students, will be really enriched by the valuable speech of two renowned speakers today. Hope that the today's webinar will be a grand success. Thank you, everybody, once again. Thank you. 
Thank you, <coughs> Honorable Principal, Dr. Ashokumar Mondal. Now, thank you. I would I would request Professor Ashokumar Roy, Coordinator IQC, to say a few words about today's webinar. Professor Roy. Good morning. On behalf of IQAC Bosirat College, I welcome all of you this webinar session. We extend our thanks to the Department of Chemistry of our college to organize such a promising seminar on academically and socially important topics. We are thankful to the resource person to be present here for delivering their valuable lectures. Arranging webinars like this is definitely a step uh, towards enhancing the internal quality of the institution concerned. We have tried to extend minimal technical support uh, for organizing this seminar. Hope you will enjoy the session very much and it will be a great success. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Roy. Now, I would like to invite Professor Shayan Bhattacharya to deliver his talk. Before he start his lecture, I would like to say something about Professor Shayan Bhattacharya. Shayan Bhattacharya is Professor of Department of Chemical Science, Iser Kolkata, since September 2019. He is the founder and chair of Center of Advanced Functional material at Iser Kolkata. Professor Bhattacharya obtained his PhD degree at the Indian Institute of Technology, Kanpur, in 2006. He did his postdoctoral research at Bar Ilag University, Israel, from 2006 to 2008, and Bristol University, USA, 2008 to 2010. He joined Iser Kolkata in April 2010 as assistant professor. He is a material chemist interested in catalysis for energy, photovoltaics, magnetism, and biological application. A combination of weight chemical synthesis and cell as assembly of smart nanomaterial. Structure property, correlation, and device application are used to attain these research goals. In 2017, Dr. Bhattacharya has been highlighted as one of the emerging investigators by the Journal of Material Chemistry, A, Royal Society of Chemistry. He has received several unsolicited media coverage on his scientific research work. He is member of American Chemical Society, American Nano Society, Chemical Research Society of India, Association for Iron and Steel Technology, and American Ceramic Society, USA. Now, I would like to invite Professor Shain Bhattacharya. Yeah, thanks a lot, Monojit. Uh, it is wonderful. Uh, so th thanks to uh, the Department of Chemistry, Boshirat College, um, for this invitation. It is quite a privilege. And uh, I must tell you that at the beginning, uh, at the onset, that this is particularly for me because, uh, you know, for the place uh, which is called Goshirat, uh, my father has spent his childhood there and we still have the house uh, where my cousins uh, and also uncle live. So uh, it is quite special to me and thanks a lot for this invitation. I'm really enjoying this session. Already should present now. Monojit have to tell me whether it is visible. Is it visible, Monojit? Yes, visible, visible. Monojit. Okay, good. So, uh, let so, me start. Okay. Let me start. So, uh, so I'll be talking to you about the nano solutions to create a sustainable energy future. I am from ISER Kolkata, and as already Monojit has nicely uh, introduced me. Um, and uh, so, I first of all, I like to acknowledge all my students and postdocs, as well as the faculty members who help us in various 
measurements and the, and the characterization, etc. And also the funding agencies. Without the funding agencies, you cannot really work. So, uh, all right. So we are all uh, right now engrossed in this thing, which is called COVID-19. And uh, we are sitting at home. Many of us, many of us are coming out uh, of our uh, home. I am one of them coming to my office. Uh, so we are all waiting for the solution, which is a vaccine. And as we receive the news, uh, so there are a lot of vaccines which are being made right now, and we are waiting for them to come to the market. So this is something, this is a you know, threat which we can see, a bigger threat which we um, are not able to see every day, which is a larger invisible scare, which there is a climate change. You know, the Arctic polar ice is melting uh, every year. So you can see that over the years uh, where uh, it is the blue to going to yellow and red means actually the temperature of the earth is going up. So this is something that, that uh, which is very uh, sc uh, scary and we are all looking forward to solve it. Uh, the worldwide researchers all are trying to do something about that. Uh, so from very polluted cities, we want to really make very clean cities uh, which do not uh, uh, depend on this kind of gasoline and we want to make very clean you know ones which just uh, with solar cells with some clean fuel etc and uh, when I talk about the fuel of course the things that come to our mind is petrol diesel and all and so we have to go to the cleaner versions which is hydrogen fuel uh, which we can run a car uh, people have uh, you know researchers have tried and they have what they have already made few but uh, it has to come out on a on a mass scale which is still far away um okay so because of all this the renewable energy comes into the picture and renewable energy has become so much important i tell you my son is in fifth standard and in his class also uh, there is a subject in this in the science which is actually renewable energy and um, so they are also being taught all this and in our childhood we never have thought of that we knew all that uh, so renewable energy is going to occupy everything uh, in the 21st uh, cent century, definitely, uh, besides others like actually healthcare, which forms a major part as well. So among the renewable energy, you have several types, which is biomass, solar, geothermal, wind, water. So these are the sources that we should utilize. Now, when I talk about solar and water, so these two I, am, I will mainly uh, you know, uh, cover what are these and how we work in them. So solar means that uh, we basically, uh, we are talking about the solar cells and we are also talking about something which is photo. Photo means photochemistry, photoelectrochemistry means where we basically use the photons coming from the sun. So now if you really look at the global energy consumption here, the present situation that we use is around 12.8 ter terawatt, okay? And uh, in 2050, we, we actually, uh, we foresee that it will be something like around 30 ter terawatt. The solar energy that comes, this is per year, I mean. So uh, the solar that comes to our earth, it is around 160,000 terawatt. So you can just imagine we do not use even 1% of the solar energy that comes to our earth. So that is a vast resource of energy and we must work towards it and must, uh, must uh, to utilize that. So utilization of solar energy is a must and because you all see the solar cells on the top and more and more uh, you know, research is coming up in this area. And of course, uh, the, on the rooftops that you basically see, you basically see the type one, you know, the first, uh, the, uh, you know, the generation of solar cells, which is basically the silicon wafers. So uh, silicon wafers, you know, most of the solar cells that you see on your, in your house or not in your house, maybe in some other house, some other office buildings, those are made of silicon. These are very expensive. You can see the cost here, which is very high. And this efficiency is also limited. The second uh, generation of solar cells came up, which are based on the thin films. Now, the thin film solar cells, of course, they have a lower cost as compared to the silicon wafers. But at the same time, this you know all, all this efficiency, if you see, it is also limited in, in some way. The third generation solar cells, everybody is trying to uh, you know work on now and find out the best possible solutions. 
Um, and the third generation solar cells, if you can see, this efficiency can really go up high, whereas the cost you can still limit. So you have to lower the cost, whatever applications you do. I think some of you have put your audio on. If you kindly uh, mute, uh, it will be very nice. Uh, thank you very much. So um, uh, this will be like, you know, everybody's working. So um, you can see this is the chart. This is the latest chart of solar cells. So in short, we can call that photovoltaics, uh, means we apply the voltage and we get the current. And uh, so, and also the, the, by the solar energy, we also get the voltage from, uh, from the solar energy. So uh, here you see the different forms of solar cells uh, which are there. And the nano-based, nanomaterial-based solar cells are still lying here. This one, the, this open, uh, you know, uh, these cubes. Uh, so these are the quantum dot sensitized solar cells. We have worked a lot in the past. Uh, now we have reduced. Uh, these are the perovskite solar cells, which I will tell you uh, today about. This you see, they have both started after 2010. Okay, very, very recent, not even 10, uh, 10 years. And you look at the perovskite solar cell, it started close to 2014, and you see the jump, and it has really reached very high efficiency, around 25%. And that's what these are the four major types of third generation solar cells. One is the perovskite solar cells, which have really reached 25%. Disensitized solar cells, I will say a bit you know, saturated right now in terms of efficiency, which is 12.3%. These organic solar cells have made a quantum jump in the, in, in the last year, as well as the quantum dot solar cells. It was 10% for a very long time recently, 2020, I think it has gone up to 16%. So these are the major types, major attention is taken away by these perovskite solar cells. All right, so the second uh, thing that we all uh, you know, look forward to is a clean fuel, okay? As I said, petrol, diesel, we don't want to use in the, in, in the, in the future, so we have to find out something which is useful. So one thing which is very light, which is environmentally friendly, is basically this hydrogen fuel. So uh, this conversion of hydrogen, uh, something to this hydrogen gas is fine, but storing this hydrogen inside is of course a problem. You can see this is actually the hydrogen storage tank. So the ways that we make it, they are not very uh, good enough. The most important, you know, this hydrogen which is made actually is by steam methane reforming. What happens is from the methane, you get this hydrogen fine, but the end, you also end up with carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide. And you see this methane, uh, uh, you know, this reforming, whatever this hydrogen is made, they are basically utilized in the Heber Bosch process. I will tell you soon uh, to make the fertilizers and to get the ammonia to react with nitrogen. So it, it occupies a large portion and this process actually is not very much environmentally friendly. The one which is environmentally friendly, we have everywhere on this art, is water. And you have to basically split water. What do you have? We all know water is H2O. So this is H, this is H, this is oxygen. And you have to break these bonds here, these OH bonds. And this is not an easy process. Why? Because it goes through a high activation energy barrier. Okay? So through a high activation barrier from water to two molecules of hydrogen, one molecule of oxygen, if you just go for, what happens is you have to supply a lot of energy, right? And that is not very much, uh, uh, you cannot do it at the industrial scale. So for that, what you basically need is you need a catalyst. And if you need a catalyst, you can simply drop down this activation energy barrier. And so it can still feasible to pass on from the left to the right. So the overall process, if you look at H2O plus 2H2O and O2, it has a potential. This is a thermodynamic potential, which is 1.23 volt. And you see that this 1.23 volt involves a delta G of 237 kilojoule per mole, which is pretty, pretty high. Now, you have two basic reactions here, which goes on oxygen evolution reaction, which is OER. This goes on at the anode. So I'm now slowly moving into electrochemistry. Okay, electrochemistry without electrochemistry. Electrochemistry is something which you can do at uh, normal, you know, this room, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, this climate. And also you do not need to apply the pressure. You do not need to heat. 
so it is very much environmentally friendly so electrochemistry forms the a major base for the renewable energy so this oxygen evaluation reaction oer it goes on at the anode and hydrogen evaluation reaction hr goes on at the cathode now if you look if you look very well internet please your ppt is not visible sir really yes sir someone was presenting and that's why your ppt has been gone in the layer something hard okay i'll i will come back now is it visible no wait a minute please I think please uh, request everyone to mute their microphone, else it becomes really a problem. Uh, so much sound is coming up. Now is it visible? No, sir. Okay, sir. Now it's visible. Okay, good. And I'm making it at full screen. Is it okay? Yes, sir. It's okay. Okay. So whenever you see that it is not working, you just let me know. Okay. Okay, sir. Yeah. So um, if you look here, so oxygen uh, the evolution reaction it involves a transfer of four electrons. So transferring four electrons, you do not transfer at a time. It what it actually works one by one. All the four electrons. Um, and this hydrogen evolution reaction, it involves two electrons and basic medium. Okay. Now, you, this, is comp this is easier, but this hydrogen evolution reaction in, you know, indirectly depends on this one as well, because if the anodic process do not work, how the cathodic process will work. So you need a very good catalyst for this OER at the anode and HER at the cathode or you can use the same catalyst if they can work very well. Okay, so uh, this is what it is, as I told you, that anode oxygen comes out and cath cathode hydrogen comes out. This is called the electrolysis of water, or you can call it water splitting. Uh, and so basically you need to have the catalyst nanoparticles, which you need to put on top of these electrodes. Okay. Now, Apart from the catalyst, you, what you are seeing here is a modeling of the atoms of over with the nanoparticle catalyst here, these green ones with the blue ones uh, here and here. So they are sitting on top of a substrate. Now, why is this substrate? Because substrate is something which you need to clamp, okay? Clamp it and put it inside the electrolyte. That is important. Now, it has to conduct the electrons. So if the substrate is not electrically conducting or is less electrically conducting, it is a major issue. So your substrate also should take be given enough attention apart from the uh, the catalyst on the surface. And the catalyst should anchor to this uh, substrate not only physical adsorption, but they should bind chemically if it's possible. Because if you want to uh, run your things for a very long time, the catalyst particle should not leach out from the surface of this electrode. Okay, so um, all of you know this man, uh, Michael Faraday. Okay, so he is, I consider, I respect him a lot, and he is basically the father of electrochemistry. And uh, look at the timeline, he was alive. He expired, he left us on 1867. All right, so he worked on also magnetism, he worked on this electrochemistry. He is a multi talented scientist, wonderful. I mean, very rarely you find a person like him. Now, the next thing that I'm going to show you is here. You see, when electron was found first time, 1897 by Thomson, after he expired, okay, after he's gone, after 30 years. Now, can you imagine anybody is, is talking about doing all kinds of experiments on electrochemistry, magnetism, without knowing what is an electron? Can we imagine that? We don't, but he could, okay? 
So that is the greatness of this person, Michael Faraday. And uh, every time we use you know, you know, the Faraday constant with other things, uh, the Faraday balance we use, so all come from, uh, from him. Uh, the, uh, the father of modern electrochemistry is Alan Bird. Uh, he's still alive. He's in Texas. Uh, he uh, basically found out with various new techniques, and he has a very good book. He he wrote uh, scanning electron uh, electrochemical the microscope electrochemiluminescence and photoelectrochemistry. All he started in his time. So he's called the father of modern electrochemistry. So that you know this is the basis of the entire thing. The you know in the renewable energy that we are talking about. You can either do electrochemistry in the dark. Or you can do electrochemistry in the presence of light. When you do it in the dark, you call it simple electrochemistry. When you do it in the presence of light, you call it photoelectrochemistry. That's it. Now what happens here? You have an electrode which has to conduct the electrons. Now the reactant O has to come in contact with this electrode. And then it will accept this electron here. And it will move to, the, to R, which is the product. And the product has to go away, else a fresh reactant cannot come again. And if the product do not go away, then the, the product will sit on top of the electrode surface, so the slowly the current will drop. Okay, so here what happens? You have an oxidized spaces, so I'm talking about the reduction. I'm not talking about oxidation here. Please note, if, they scan, if, it's, uh, if it's oxygen, it will uh, give away the electrons. Okay, this is reduction I'm talking about. So of oxidized spaces comes to the surface of the electrode. It accepts the electron, becomes R, which is a product, the green one, and the green product has to go away from the surface of the electrode. A fresh reactant has to come in, right? So what happens here is, if the product concentration will increase, Okay, how the product is forming? By accepting the electron. Okay, reactant is accepting the electron. So there is the product concentration will increase if the electron flow is high. And if the electron flow is high, the current will also increase. So if the current increases, you know the product concentration has also increased. Okay, I hope I made it uh, clear. Uh, for uh, uh, people who are not, uh, you know, familiar with this uh, with this area, so if you apply the same current at a lower applied voltage, means you need to apply lower amount of energy. The voltage is nothing but the input energy. You have to input lesser amount of energy to get the same amount of current. Say a current of ten. 10 milliamp per centimeter square, or there is a current, uh, you know, the density. You can also have 100 milliamp per centimeter square current density. And so, if you need a lower amount of voltage by using a catalyst, you know that that catalyst is a better catalyst. And when you put the catalyst on top of the electrode, you know that it is a better electrode. Okay. So this is how it happens. So normally, uh, we are uh, we read so many of us about cyclic voltage. It is about the redox process, both oxidation and reduction. Linear sweep volt, uh, voltammetry do not look at both the sides. It looks only one, either reduction or oxidation. So here I'm talking about this oxygen evolution reaction, OER, which I've already told you. So here what we use, we use a linear sweep volt, voltammetry. So first of all, we have to scan the potential uh, within uh, the potential means the voltage. Okay, so we have to scan this within a range slowly and we see how much current is coming. Now, how we validate the catalyst, how we know a catalyst is good or bad. Okay, so there should be some, uh, some, uh, you know, uh, the guidelines. So 1.23 volt, as I told you, for water splitting is the thermodynamic potential. Now we take 10 milliamp per centimeter square as the standard because it gives 10% solar to uh, fuel. Okay, that is enough actually. So which catalyst gives 10 milliamp per centimeter square at a lower voltage? That's what you want. So we, I will show you three curves for three catalysts, red, blue, green. You see the red one even do not reach 10 and it requires a large voltage. So red is not a good catalyst. The curve is not from a good catalyst I mean. So blue is better than red because it goes up here, it requires lower voltage. Green is the best among the three. 
Now, how we quantify this uh, catalyst? We look at 10 million per centimeter square. This is the thermodynamic potential. What is the excess potential is needed to reach 10 million per centimeter square? And this is called over potential. So lower the over potential, better the catalyst. And so at the same time, the catalyst should be cost effective as well. Now, this is for the reduction, that is hydrogen evolution reaction, HER. The same way, you take at minus 10 million per centimeter square, and here the thermodynamic potential is zero. So uh, the blue and green, if you see, this is the over potential. Green is better than blue, right? Fine. So the more the current you see, the more the current means uh, the product uh, concentration is also going up because more number of electrons flow. In photoelectrochemistry, what you have basically, you have the N type semiconductor, P type semi semiconductor. Now, when you supply the photons, what the photons will do, it will excite the electrons. Now, there should be a material which should basically absorb these electrons. Uh, so, sorry, absorb the photons. The electron should absorb the photons. Now, when it gets when it absorbs, it will get excited. Now, if it gets uh, gets um, excited, where is it supposed to go? So we, we all know about valence band, conduction band, or in other words, HOMO and LUMO. So HOMO and LUMO mostly are basically the energy levels is mostly applied to the, to the molecules, where for solid state materials, we call them bands because there are many levels which are joined together to form bands. So here comes the valence band and the conduction band this is for the N-type semiconductor. And for the P-type semiconductor, you have the same thing. Now, when the electron, you move from here to here or from here to here, you have should have enough photon energy to push this electron from valence to conduction band. And so the, the, the band alignment takes place. There's a band bending, which occurs between the two at this junction. So this is called the PN junction. OK? So the N type, what they do, they emit these electrons. Now, these electrons are going away. So if you connect it through an external circuit, it will come back, these electrons. So electron is coming this way, means hole will go in this opposite way. Right, so the N type will emit electrons, P type will receive them, ah, and so when you basically irradiate with light, so mostly the P type semiconductors they are used as a cathode, like a photocathode, and the N type semiconductors they are called a photoanode because the electrons will go to the external circuit and they will give away the holes to the reactant and they will oxidize. They will get they, they will get oxidized. So that is the whole principle which works in case of photoelectrochemistry in presence of light. You need somebody to absorb light. Please note, for electrochemistry, we need the electrodes are mostly made up of metals because they are basically conducting more. In case of photoelectrochemistry, you have to use semi or semiconductors because they have to absorb light. Right? So there are three major ways to split water. One is the electrolysis of water, which I already told you. So simply you pass on these electric the current being passed through the water, so you get hydrogen and oxygen here. Photoelectrochemical water splitting, just now I said, this is called the holy grail, the most pure pure form of water splitting, that's what it means. So here, what you have, uh, so you can basically, this is a photoanode. You see here, a photoanode, so this is absorbing the light. This, is may, this may be a platinum electrode. Okay, this is a cathode. This is not actually absorbing light. Only one is uh, one is absorbing light. It is okay. It can. So you can make both of them to absorb light or one of them to absorb light. It is fine. So it absorbs the light. It may gives you this oxygen. Whereas these uh, electrons, they come through this and it will transfer to the, to the H plus the protons and will form H2. Now the other is photochemical water splitting, which is also observed. So electrochemistry, photoelectrochemistry, electrochemistry is the best according to me because you can get the largest amount of hydrogen. Photochemistry is slightly uh, the least because the amount of hydrogen which you get is not enough according to me. Here you do not need to apply voltage. You do not. There is no question of current and voltage. Simply uh, you you immerse the semiconductor inside the electrolyte, uh, the water. And uh, you have this, uh, you know, you should have a co-catalyst co like a metal islands on top of the semiconductor where this uh, reduction will take place. And uh, here you have this oxidation which takes place. So these are the three major ways. The other one, what we have worked on in the past, uh, let me see. Yeah. So this, what we have worked on in the past is that 
you should have the solar cells which are connected in series. Why in series? Because you need to increase the open circuit voltage. Okay, so that voltage you supply to this electrolyzer, you connect it through uh, some kind of external integration. Okay, and then this is also a very, very useful form, but the amount of hydrogen that you get depends on the, this kind of, uh, the, how good this solar cell is. Okay, if you use a solar cell which has a very good efficiency, you, you, you of course get it. And we have got something like around close to 10, 10 per person because the solar cells we made in the lab, this electrolyzer also we made in the lab. Okay, and you see that over time, the current slightly drops, uh, it is on off dark and light and uh, it slightly drops but is uh, still okay after uh, for some cycles. All right, so after water spring, all of you can uh, uh, hear me and see the slides. Am I too fast? Uh, Monojit? Yeah. Okay, okay. Okay, good. Uh, ring good. Yeah, good. Okay, so, Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So uh, the other important reaction that we all uh, look forward to is basically the carbon dioxide reduction. So we have a lot of that carbon dioxide, which is a greenhouse gas. And so what you need to do is you can run, you can do a electro reduction, electro re uh, reduction you can do. So carbon dioxide, put it inside here and you get several products. Okay. Now the products that you get depends on what kind of catalyst you use. So you basically can get, suppose, methanol, ethanol, and with that, you can run a car, okay? But 100% conversion to, a, to one kind of, you know, uh, the product is always a tough ask. What happens here, like this is one very, very much interesting uh, way that if you do water oxidation, same way, and the protons, you transfer here, and the CO2, you react with it, and you get basically methanol. Okay, but 100% methanol, as I say, any product 100% uh, the Faradic efficiency you cannot do. Now, the reduction process, this is a cathodic process. This is a cathodic process. Now, when it's a cathodic process, you have water in the, uh, in the medium. So hydrogen evolution also takes place simultaneously. So both of them compete with each other. So whenever you do carbon dioxide reduction, you have to make sure you use a catalyst which do not favor that this kind of you know, the HER process that is water to the hydrogen. Okay, basically you need more of this product. So you can get a variety of uh, products like CO, formic acid, ethylene, methane. And if you look at uh, like, uh, all, like all of them have some use, like formic acid is used as anti, uh, anti bacterial agent and CO is used in industry, you know, the chemical industries and so on. And all of them, like you can also get alcohols, you can get other things, so depending on what kind of catalyst you use. Mostly the noble metals are being used as the catalyst, but now uh, the other form of catalyst have also come up, like molybdenum sulfide and others, uh, vanadium nitride and so on. So the copper is a very good catalyst in many ways. So the product depends on the catalyst you choose. So that is what, what you make. And now global warming, when I'm talking about, this is the one. Haber Bosch process. At the same time, if we say that, what is the you know, innovation of the 20th century? What will stand out? There are many. You have aeroplanes, you have thousand things which came up. Which is the foremost and most important? This, I'm not saying nature, uh, Smil has said that none can match the synthesis of ammonia from its elements, nitrogen and hydrogen. Without ammonia, there would be no inorganic fertilizers and nearly half the world would go hungry without fertilizers. So if you have ammonia, you can convert it to the urea and other fertilizers. You can basically grow crops. You can feed people. So this is basically one of the industrial revolution that has happened in the past. Two people are mainly responsible for whom this name came up, the Heber-Bosch process. Fries, Heber, and Carl Bosch, they got no Nobel Prize, not in the same year, in different year. But one thing is that this has helped us to get food for such a long time, but they use high pressure and temperature. And pressures up to 20 megapascals and temperature from and above 
uh, 500 degrees centigrade. And this sucks up about 1%, and it contributes more than 1%, I think, of the, the global warming that you are seeing now. Okay? Because so much high pressure is used, so much temperature is used to convert nitrogen to ammonia. So this is a major research area, I must say. And uh, so electrochemistry, applying electrochemistry, can you convert nitrogen to ammonia? All right. So you need to do that for applying various catalysts. It started from um, the percent of the ammonia. Now, all these reactions, remember, they compete with the hydrogen from water to, uh, to this hydrogen. So it depends on what you want and that kind of catalyst you have to use, okay? So from ni uh, this ni nitrogen, you can get N2H4 and from there it goes on and then you can get at this ammonia. And it is a very complicated process and uh, it, uh, it's a cathodic uh, process. Okay, I'll come to some of our research now, a lot of introduction I gave uh, here. So, um, this is ICER, and uh, ICER, Kolkata particularly, chemistry department is doing very well, and I'm happy to show you these uh, numbers. This is four uh, in chemistry in India, fifth among all Indian academic uh, institutions, eighth among all Indian institutions, 48 among the young the global universities, and 339 ranking overall all over the world. Okay, uh, this is the main gate of ICER. You're most welcome to visit. And uh, so these are the these are the areas that we work on. So electrochemical water splitting. I have already told you hybrid perovskite solar cells. I will tell you soon. We also work on metal layer batteries. I'll give you a glimpse of that. We worked a lot on quantum dot solar cells. So all these bold ones are basically contribute to the uh, to the renewable energy. We have side by interest where we work on nano bio I mean, the interface like cancer and other anti -bac uh, uh, antibacterial uh, things as well as magnetism. Uh, which I am trained at my PhD days. All right, so this is what we do. We uh, synthesize the material. A very good synthetic hand is necessary and fully depend on my students. I tell you this, uh, they are the best. I have very good students. I'll show their photo at the last slide. Now, the proper material de design is necessary. And once you design these materials, you have to, you have to characterize them by various techniques, spectroscopy, uh, many, I mean, the electron microscopy and so on. And then you have to apply them. What is the application you are aiming for? So the desired results, you have something in your mind. If you do not get them, you have to go back here and you have to tune the synthesis again to get the appropriate material. What is, why it is not you know, happening, what, what we want, so that we need to see. So again, we come back, maybe we, uh, we might end up with some very good uh, results. Now, when we get the results, this is what is called material science. Now, what the science is missing here is that unless you understand what is taking place. So basically now, through structural elucidation, if you have to do structured property correlation, then you have a proper understanding of your system and your property and applications will have the perfect synergy with each other. Okay. Now, we work a lot on nanomaterials. Um, um, nano is a Greek word, means you know, dwarf, very small. Okay, I'm not showing the hands just for a baby. This is what it is. This is what you have heard about nanometer. Now, we all face it every day. Our nail grows every second, and that is the length of one nanometer. For students, if you are not being exposed to this, from bulk to nano, uh, basically, the determining factor is surface area to volume ratio. And uh, if you look at two cubes, one small and one big, if you see so the one side is one and here is five. So 6s square, you know, and here you have six, and here it is one, 150. Total volume here is uh, a cube, so one and 125. Surface area by volume, this ratio, if you take, here it comes six, here it comes one, well, 1.2. 1 so uh, what do you see here? Basically, that the small cube have um, larger surface area to volume. So surface is more exposed. When the surface is exposed as compared to the bulk, what happens is you have larger chance to basically play with the surface. So you can introduce various new properties to the system. Now, I can think of to assemble all the small cubes and make the big cube. Okay, the total surface area goes up. Okay, 
a lot you see when you assemble the same thing you are you have but you these are assembled now surface area is high volume is also high and surface area to, the volume is also has increased from 1.2 so that's what so if your size is going smaller from large to small if you make very small nano nanoparticles and so the bulk atoms now the atoms which are inside they basically reduce in fraction and surface at surface atoms they grow up okay so this is the basis of uh, this nano uh, thing now we work a lot on quantum dots okay the quantum dots basically re relate to the semiconductor nano particles so we, we all know about one dimensional particle in a box analogy if i take here so you have basically length of the box is a and if you put on this equation this energy it is inversely proportional to a so if you reduce a the size of the length you know the length of the box your energy should go up because it is inversely proportional correct the quantum dot is something this we can take the take this analogy like this a is similar to the you know the diameter of the your nano nanoparticle so this is a so if a is less than twice the vore excitonic radius we call it a quantum dot so basically the electrons are confined that much we say so these are called quantum con uh, confinement effect so you can see from a large particle here to a small particle here what is, if it's large means here a is large so energy will be less here a is small energy will be high so if energy is high means the band gap will be higher and here the size um, bigger means band gap will be lower so you have uh, the whole world in front in your hands what is the size you want what kind of uh, nanomaterial you want you can change the solution color uh, it will absorb the right color based on the band gap and you know, the the electromagnetic spectrum like this valence band to co conduction band energy will uh, tell you what kind of color uh, the the quantum dot solution will have okay so coming back to this thing i'll tell you quickly about some uh, the proskite uh, solar cells uh, and um, as I said, it is right here. Now, perovskite, it is simple ABO3, we know, which is perovskite oxide. Now, this is basically ABX3. And um, so here, X is minus one charge. You can see Cl, Bri, these halides. And so uh, the A and B should also be plus three, correct? So what happens is A is uh, plus one and B is always plus two. Or B, you can basically mix up between uh, with between two metals of plus one and plus three. So you can make an average of that. So those are different kinds. This is the simplest one. So you have basically methyl ammonium ion, cation. You have uh, cesium as well. Lead comes in. Lead is toxic, but this works the best. So what happens here? So this is the crystal structure. This is a cubic structure, and most importantly, it involves earth abundant elements means it is cheaper low temperature solution processing is possible they have high absorption they are very small binding energy and they have very good charge mobilities and if you look here you normal semiconductors if you see this is a valence band this is a conduction band okay and uh, this is the mid gap this is the band gap now there are various you know the defects which come in so the defects what they do they create the mid gap steps here so that you know, you know the trend, the transition, it comes here, but it can again slow down the process, and it can ha happen through this. So you basically get the different band, okay? In case of the perovskites, why it is so good? Be because the defect bands mostly lie at the bottom of this conduction band, so they do not interfere with your absorption, and you know, the process or the emission process at all. But there are challenges, as I said, toxic lead. If you make lead free, the solar cell performance of lead free systems are not that good uh, because uh, of other reasons. And uh, they are not stable in moisture, thermal and thermodynamic stabilities are not good. So research is going on in this. Like I can tell you one example, like CSPBI3 alpha phase, black in color. It, it is in less than 315 degrees C, it transforms into orthorhombic, this yellow delta phase. Now it has a band gap, the 1.72, but this becomes this orthorhombic phase has a large band gap, so it becomes insulating. 
So this is one work which uh, uh, done in our uh, lab a few years back. So I can tell you this. So we use basically the surfactants, and you have to, be, you, you, you know, in nanoparticles, what happens is when you make small particles, the surface energy is always high, and every system tries to minimize the energy. So in that way, uh, they will start to, uh, you know, join together agglomerate. So if you have a surfactant coating on the surface of these particles, you basically can avoid that and you can return those small particles. So from lead iodide, you start with and you add where it is reducing agents and the surfactants, and then you end up with this kind of a color, which is CSPBI3. Now here, what instead of the size, now size is constant. What I'm doing here, I'm doing, I'm changing this halide. So this is I3, Br3, Br2I, 1.5, 1.5, and BRI2. So by changing the, you know, this halide, what happens is you can tune the band gap also. So this is a, the beauty of the systems, and so you can change the color of this, uh, this uh, solutions as well. So when I talk about solar cells, this is the way we make it. Like you have a conducting fluorine doped tin oxide glass, which is a conducting glass, trans, uh, transparent. You need a N-type semiconductor like compact TiO2. Uh, you have to have the mesoporous TiO2, which have a lot of pores. So when we can put the bulk system, this is not this is not a nano system. This is the bulk system. Uh, we can also mix up the nano here. This is the uh, this is the absorber, which is the proskite. This one, methyl ammonium lead iodide. So some chloride is also there. And after that, this is the electron transporting layer. Okay, it transports the electrons this side this is the whole transporting material okay uh, various whole transporting materials they are they are very expensive uh, sometimes people are making some new ones and you need to have the top contact which is gold just a minute uh, somebody has somebody has started screen sharing uh, and yeah, so what uh, can you not see uh, my slides? No, 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 it's not visible. Somebody has started screen sharing. Somebody else. <laughs> it's gone again. Uh, stopping, please. Stopping, please. Yeah, somebody has to the somebody has to do that. Chingwai, Chingwai, uh, please. Uh, monitor. What I have to do? Somebody else. But uh, we can see your screen presentation. Oh, you can see? Yeah. Very good. Very good. Yeah, yeah. Now it's okay. Okay, good. Maybe uh, somebody can mute. So much sound is coming. Thank you. Sound is coming. Yeah. It's okay. Yeah, good. Th thank you very much. So this is the way we make the solar cells. So uh, when you connect it, the you know um, uh, the, these wires, so basically the holes can go this side, the electrons go this side, and you create a you complete the circuit. This is a current voltage uh, plot. So uh, this is uh, the curve. Okay, this is this is actually the fourth quadrant has has been inverted uh, here. And so this is the you know the, you know, the perovskite, and this is the whole transport material. Uh, spiro o emitter with the methyl uh, this thing and then the electrons cannot go here because the the energy is lower from low to high energy it cannot pass it can pass from a high to lower energy so electrons move this side to tio2 and to fto whereas the holes basically go this side and from here the electrons come to the external circuit connect here okay so uh, or, or you can extract it to the electrical energy here, the efficiency is around 14.5%. Now, I tell you a few examples like the surface of, of, this, of this absorber is very much important. Yes? Sorry? Uh, OK, the, the surface of this absorber is very much important. Like, if it's too much rough, what happens is interrupt you interrupt your slide. Your slide doesn't visible. Slides are not now. visible. Excuse me. Slides are not visible. Yeah. Uh -huh. OK. Is it visible? No, no, no. Where am I? Yes. Just, just, just a moment. I've changed. Hmm. 
Is it visible now? No, no, no. Just wait for some. Yes, time. now it is visible. Okay, good. Okay, okay. Please mute your mic your microphones, please. Yes, yes. So yeah, so if the if the surface is too rough, what happens is whatever the electrons that needs to be you know they transfer to the electron transporting material like TiO to titanium uh, uh, dioxide, you cannot extract all the electrons. So you have a lot of recombination pathways. Now when you excite this electron from electron, it goes from balance to conduction band. You create this the, this electron hole pair, which is act, which is act actually this exciton so this kind of recombination should not take place you should be able to extract this excited electron away now if you cannot do that this electron recombines with the uh, the hole and this electron is lost so that is not what we want so electron needs to be uh, to be extracted and roughness what creates is a lot of trap states they form and this kind of recombination you know happens here so what we did uh, this is a uh, simple, you know, the perovskite here, and here we have modified with some quantum dots, like cesium lead iodide, uh, you know, the bromide quantum dots. And so once we do that, what we do, we spin coat with this, and we put it on the top, these quantum dots, and we get uh, different layers. So this is only with an anti-solvent, which is chlorobenzene. And so you see that these are the, the grains. This is a schematic. So you have larger grains. Now, when you put the quantum dots there, the quantum dots basically fill the grain boundaries, and as well as they can sit on top of the grains. So they provide the electron percolation pathways through in, means in between the grains. Okay. So you see here, these these are the scanning electron microscope images. This is not uh, modified. This is the chlorobenzene. And this is with quantum dots. You see the roughness has uh, has been reduced a lot. And this is atomic force microscopy. You see the same way that roughness has been uh, reduced. And of course, and it is needless to say that uh, the electron transfer and hole transfer depends a lot on this elect uh, on the band alignments, like whether the band is suitable or not. So. This is by ultraviolet photoelectron spectroscopy. As we uh, deposit the quantum dots on the films, we see that uh, the the band gap changes as as well as your uh, the labels, the conduction band and the valence band labels. This energy also changes. So this energy has to be such that the electron goes here to TiO2, and the holes basically go to this valence band uh, to this hole transporting material on the right. Okay. So smooth electron and hole transfer is necessary. At the same time, the electron and hole should be transferred at the same time. Now, what is the range of uh, the time scale we are talking about? We are talking about something like in the picosecond time scale. Okay. So the electron is transporting here to the electron transporting layer, and hole is transported here to the hole transporting layer. You see that here the time scale is 1.4 picosecond, and here it is 2.7. So they are not similar. So there is a chance of recombination. So that's how this system, CSPB to BR3, do not work very well because the electron and hole they are not been uh, they are not being extracted at the same time. But when you have this system, you see on this on this interface here it is 0.5 picosecond. On this interface it is 0.4 picosecond. It is nearly similar. So at the same time, electron and hole can be transferred. So these are done by femtosecond uh, spectroscopy. Okay. Or this is picosecond spectroscopy, but done with that kind of an instrument. Uh, okay, the ID you know, uh, 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 we uh, basically get it done. So uh, same here, 1.2 and 1.1. Now these are the final efficiencies you can see. Uh, the BR 1.5 and I 1.5. This around 16.5 percent. BR I2 also very sorry. BR I2 also very similar. It is 16. Point Four five, so around sixteen point five, but this one works better because stability is also an important uh, issue, and this one is more stable than uh, the other one. Now it is important. So far, what I have shown you, and ma majority of the people work in this, that they make very small area cells. You have seen the solar panels, right? They are very big, so they are not so small. So there's one that in the in the lab scale we make, they are 0 0.04 centimeters uh, square. If people even work with less than that. Frankly, and they report a lot of efficiencies. 
Okay, this is at the lab scale. Now, whenever we try to make a larger area cell, this is one centimeter square. What happens is the same this efficiency, you know, uh, it will uh, drop down because the larger area you can you can understand uh, that uh, with a larger area, the consistency of electron and hole uh, transfer will of course not to be the same, and that's why it has to uh, go down. But still, this thirteen percent is not bad. It's pretty good. Okay, the other thing that I'm going to show you here is another type of uh, I'll, I have to be a, a little quick I think the other type of uh, quantum dot which is a core shell this is gold at the core and a CZTS quantum dot you know this is the shell so when you put them so you can vary the size of this by varying the reaction time from 30 to 120 minutes means two or two hours so you can vary the band gap this way 1.47 to 1.54 electron volt and if you, this is the electron uh, microscope mapping, these are called uh, STEM, scanning transmission electron microscope mapping, this head of map mapping, dark field imaging. So here you can see that uh, over this whole absorber layer, uh, all this, uh, the quantum dot the elements as well as the CZTS all are lying at the same time. So they are basically uniformly uh, spaced. You can see these quantum dots which are here. So similarly, you need to have a band alignment, as I have already told you. Now, in this case, we have reached something like up to 20%. Uh, uh, so the world record is 25%, but with a, a smaller area cell. And here uh, you can see that the distribution over the many uh, many solar cells that we made, this uh, kind of the, you know, the efficiency varies very narrowly. So that, that means it is more or less consistent and it is reproducible as well. And Last but not the least here, that this efficiency is okay, but stability is also very much uh, uh, important. So what we have seen is that even after 35 days, only less than 20% drop in efficiency has taken place. So uh, the last part I will tell you about this hydrogen fuel, what we have done. So uh, I have showed you this. Now our motto is to avoid noble metals because they are basically expensive and to have a cost effective systems uh, apart from a very good performance, they have uh, should have the durability, which is also high. Now, first thing I'll tell you about the self-supported and flexible electrode. You see this two; these are the substrates. If you bend up and down, you see the cracks on the on this surface, which is not a good thing. Here, if you do this, you do not see the see the cracks. So this is better, and this can only happen if you have a flexible substrate because it has to sustain this energy conversion thing for a long time okay there are many uh, many uh, uh, many commercial substrates which are available in the market we also use them but my student he's in mit right now he said uh, this is atharva who has done this so he's a pip why don't we start with paper as if, uh, if you can do it is very good so he did he I uh, did this. So the, I started with a filter paper, which is a cellulose paper, and he dipped in the tin salt. So tin uh, gets over this uh, cellulose paper. He dips it into the palladium salt. Tin reduces PD2 plus to metallic pal palladium. It, uh, it is basically activated paper. And finally, from this palladium coated paper, he put it on Ni2 plus uh, salt. So here, palladium reduces nickel 2 to nickel 0 that is metallic nickel, and we have the nickel nanoparticle coated paper. This is, as I'm saying, it is very easy, it is not easy, and we took a long time to get this, frankly speaking, and you can basically bend it, I'll show you soon. So you can basically uh, do electro deposition, and uh, same way, and you put two different catalysts on the top, while this is either the, the, the NIFE, or you can put nickel molybdenum here. These are flake-like structures, these are basically the spherical structures. Why I call it flexible at all? So basically, here what happens is if you, this is a normal one, we twist or bend it, you see the current voltage curves do not change that much. And over many cycles also, they are more or less constant. And uh, over a uh, longer time, stability wise, if you bend it, this is the plane, you know, the paper fold it, fold it multiple times you want, the current doesn't change at a constant voltage. That means that it is, it has exceptional conductance stability. And if you change the scan rate, this is one thing about electrochemistry that you can do a lot of things. You can change the scan rate, the rate at which you change the voltage. Okay, so it is two millivolt per second. After from here, you can go up to hundred millivolt per second. 
you see these curves do not change and they more or less overlap here uh, same this is for the oer that that is oxygen evolution this is for hr the hydrogen evolution and so they have a fast mass transport mass transport means the ions are moving very fast through uh, on the surface of this electrode okay and this is the flexibility test like if you bend at different angles you can see that it is a bending angle you see the over potential that excess potential i spoke to you about that do not change and that is constant as well and they have exceptional mechanical stability and uh, if you connect the anode and cathode you get like this way you get a complete water splitting and you can do it at 1.51 volt without the catalyst the nickel paper itself also can do their job it is 1.69 volt very stable over uh, 10 days i must say continuous operation so which is very nice so we can uh, for the industrial scale we can think of like we can put it on a larger area cloth and we can put the particles on the on this and but there some particles are coming out but we have to optimize it my students have to do that but uh, so far not done the other catalyst this is also a self supported catalyst i am going to show you this too and the self supported catalyst this is a simple one but i'll tell you one very very interesting thing here that we start from a copper mesh copper mesh anybody or any one of us can get from the from the market so copper mesh you chemically oxidize it you create copper hydroxide rods on the top you will do electro reduction you get copper metallic copper nanowires now you deposit a catalyst which is a layered double hydroxide on top of it and they wrap around all these rods okay this is the rod you see the catalyst is wrapping around it the beautiful thing i show you now now uh, platinum is the benchmark catalyst okay so but platinum is you know it's very expensive gold platinum we all know that it is called white gold right so um, uh, platinum is mostly used but we need a very cheap cat catalyst what our uh, catalyst consists of it consists of nickel very cheap cobalt not that cheap but is still cheaper and copper copper is the cheapest of everything and uh, so with this system what we have achieved an over potential which is lower than platinum at 10 million per centimeter square this is at 100 you see so it beats platinum so it is an, a very exclusive result from our lab and the kinetics of both the reactions this is called a taffel slopes i have no time to tell you about this but they are more or less constant and the current density the amount of the hydrogen which comes out you see that they are very good i can tell you that with a 10 by 10 centimeter square um, this kind of a mesh and putting the rods on the top what we can achieve is we can get uh, something like uh, you know 300 uh, micromoles uh, micromoles per hour so much of hydrogen we can get okay they have exceptional st stability you see at 1 amp per centimeter square it is constant over time and different electrodes electrode 1 to electrode 5 the reproducibility is excellent as well so it is 15 plus minus 6 mill, mm, millivolt over potential uh, eta means over potential okay i come to the last part next two minutes i'll take uh, just one or two minutes so you know this is something I, uh, one more area that we work on extensively nowadays that is we all have lithium and ba uh, batteries i need not say but lithium and batteries what happens is uh, somebody has uh, unmuted okay thank you so uh, lithium and batteries we use everywhere all kinds of electronic devices in the you know the electric vehicles as well we use but we have limited abundance of lithium and uh, the cobalt is also used here cobalt is also not very cheap so we have to replace uh, the lithium and batteries and uh, various alternative uh, types of uh, the battery systems are being explored and metal air batteries ones so what happens is the air comes in you have a metal anode you have the you have the cathode and the good thing is that air is free okay so it says air is free you do not really take the weight of air so that's how the high energy density comes out in this kind of metal air battery but the power density is less so because the oxygen electrolysis is very poor i have told you about oxygen uh, this oxygen evolution it requires four four electrons so and also the other reaction i'll come to you uh, soon so what happens here zinc if i take a zinc air battery zinc goes to zn2 plus and uh, two electrons are involved oxygen o2 minus four electrons are involved the total voltage here is 1.65 volts if you if you add this two now a highly basic uh, pH is used uh, like uh, 
like uh, electrolyte, six molar KOH. Now, air comes in here. This is called the gas diffusion layer. This is the zinc anode. That's how it's called a zinc air battery. During discharge time, zinc goes to Zn2 plus, oxygen goes to OH minus. So this is the discharge time. Discharge time means when without connecting the charger, you are using your mobile. Okay. And this ORR means oxygen reduction reaction. Now, when you plug your mobile, suppose if the charge has come down, you do charging. Okay. So when you do charging, this is for metal air batteries. Mobile phones are not made with metal air batteries so far. So we can make it, but we have to see uh, when. Uh, so the charging time, this is oxygen the evolution reaction, the same four electron process and the reverse pro processes take place, the air comes out of the system. Now the, the impossible or uh, something which, uh, which is very, uh, very uh, difficult thing in the world is that the black lines, these are the thermodynamic potential range. You see that 1.65 volt. During charging, this is the blue ones blue ones this is charged this is charging charging time you have to apply more voltage which is not good so it will require more than 1.65 so you have to reduce that so that's how these arrows are like this during discharge when you are basically using it you are getting uh, less than 1.65 so this kind of you know you know this uh, these orange colored things and so you have to move this one so you have to reduce this is the this is the over potential this is also the over potential. So we need catalyst systems which can catalyze both OER and also ORR simultaneously during charging and also the discharge. So such kind of catalysts are very few. Our uh, lab is working on the perovskite oxides. I've told you about uh, the, uh, the perovskite, which are the, uh, the halide based ABX3. So here it is uh, the ABO3 or A2B2O6, the, uh, no, and the double perovskite, which we not, which we use in these kind of reactions. Uh, this is how we make the battery. You see, this is the anode side, the zinc foil, and this is the gas diffusion layer. And uh, the, we, there is a hole to which the, the air has to come, the catalyst we deposit here, and you join them and put the electrolyte inside to, uh, through a hole. And uh, our lab, when they have used uh, the battery to light a, a red LED bulb, mm -hmm. okay. Fine. A, red, a red LED bulb, so they can basically light it. OK, they can light it. All right, so I have um, uh, showed you about this, uh, coming back to this slide, mostly about solar and water. Um, and uh, this is my research group. Uh, they're wonderful uh, young scientists, budding scientists. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thanks a lot. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bhattacharya, for your illuminating lecture. It's very nice and extensive work. And this lecture is now open for discussion. Audience are requested to put their questions into chat box. Well, I want to say something. No, uh, actually, one, one, one it, like, uh, let me finish first. And I will pass all the questions to Dr. Bhattacharya. Uh, yeah, here is a question from Vishwajit Sarkar. Uh, how much energy uh, can we get from hydrogen fuel? Dr. Bhattacharya, Vishwajit Sarkar wrote, how much energy can we get from hydrogen fuel? No, how much energy? Too much of sound. Hello. Yeah. It's too much of sound. Yeah. So, uh, how much energy uh, we get uh, from this hydrogen fuel? Uh, it is uh, not like that, frankly speaking. So, hydrogen is a fuel which you have to use. So, it is a light gas. Okay. The thing is that you have to store it. You have to store. Now, the majority of these hydrogen cylinders that you see, they are done by the steam methane reforming. So you have to compress this hydrogen gas in a, in a, in a, you know, deform. So the hydrogen, if you have, you have to basically store it and then run the car. Now it depends on the, on the mileage, as you know. Okay. So if you run a car with this hydrogen, 
so it depends uh, largely on on that so it's very difficult to say how much energy exactly you get from her it depends also on what kind of application you are going to apply okay one more question uh, to ensure the road does we get any kind of success to make hydrogen fuel properly uh, till date yes uh, i have yeah sorry yeah. i have shown you our results that we can we can beat the platinum and we can get the hydrogen so um, you can get uh, 300 uh, you know means uh, 300 uh, microliter uh, you can get within no time so which is which is pretty good only thing is that <clears throat> be it solar cells be it electrochemistry you have to increase the area of the electrode so that you can apply it at the industrial uh, scale now industrial scale hydrogen production by water splitting so far well it has not come up that well i must say mostly it is done by steam methane reforming and so which uh, is not very much environmentally uh, friendly uh, one more question from a student uh, he wrote that what is the what could be the main source of for hydrogen fuel what could be a valuable source i think uh, he wants to know what could be a easily available source of hydrogen fuel uh that is water i said <laughs> is uh, water yeah yeah. Um, yeah thank you once again dr bhattacharya for his lucid and nice presentation and thank his you. extensive work thank you sir thank you uh please sir kindly thank, thank, thank you once again sir, I do, and now i do start our poster presentation actually there are 17 posters are there i'm presenting this by name and his colleagues one by one for your acknowledgement and i would like to say for poster presentation all posters that have been displayed in our college website please open it for best viewing please open it with google chrome okay actually where is uh, not clearly be seen actually please i am uh, mention uh, their name and college okay uh, dr amit kumar das bangobashi morning college Dr. Aurobindo Mondol, Bidhan Nagar College. Am I audible? Yes, sir. 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 Yes, sir
डॉक्टर शिरोपा बैनर्जी बेथून कॉलेज डॉक्टर शुभेंदु चंद्र भिक्टोरिया इंस्टीट्यूशन डॉक्टर सुमन मंडल बसिघाट कलेज डॉक्टर स्वस्तिक कर्मकार बसिघाट कलेज डॉक्टर तरुण घोष एके पीसी महाविद्यालय डॉक्टर उदय चांद शाहा इंदास महाविद्यालय मिस्टर प्रशांत दास बसिघाट कलेज actually this was the poster presentation of 70 participants from different area uh, thanks to all and, uh -huh. and uh, now i request dr bidu devna for vote of thanks well a very good afternoon to all it gives me an immense pleasure to deliver the vote of thanks for this webinar to all dignitaries assembled here i would like to thank our eminent speaker professor dr shain bhattacharya aizar kolkata for his informative and valuable talk about different parts of chemistry such as photochemistry electrochemistry hydrogen fuels and use of different catalysts for getting different renewable energy sources nanotechnology quantum dots etc and i hope we all become very much enriched from his lecture my hearty thanks also goes to professor dr samna jadav iit ism thanbad for his valuable speech about oil spills adverse effect on the environment and different methods such as supramolecular gelation etc to remove it from atmosphere especially from oceans i extend special thanks to the faculty members research scholars students who participated in this webinar in online mode i also like to thank our beloved principal of bushiat college dr ashok kumar mandal for his cooperation to arrange such a national webinar in this current covid-19 pandemic situation i also extend my thanks to dr ashok roy iqac coordinator of bushiat college for his assistance to conduct such program at last but not the least my heartfelt thanks also goes to the organizing committee for arranging such a fantastic academic webinar thank you all